Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 772. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 18th, 2022. Welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. Before we get too far in the episode, this is kind of where we, we ask you to participate. And I ask you to like this episode if you find it on YouTube or Facebook. Now, we get thousands of views every week, which is great. But we only get hundreds of likes. So I, you don't like us or you don't have time to click the like button or you can't find the like button. It looks like this. Anybody, you, you see this anywhere on this page, you, you click it, and it shows appreciation. But it also tells Facebook, it tells YouTube that this program is special and that it can it can uh, help with the advertising. We appreciate that. This show continues in the show notes and in the comments. If you like what we say, go down and give us your opinion in the comments. We would really appreciate that. Uh, and if you could share this program with your family and friends, please do that. And finally. If you're not subscribed to Anglican Scripted, most of you have, I'd appreciate that. You click on the little red rectangle, up pops a bell, you click that bell, and you will be instantly notified every Tuesday or Friday when I upload a new show. George, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I, I just love what I do. I love doing this. I'm a, I'm a happy guy. Let's see, we had our interfaith Thanksgiving service last night at the synagogue, mm -hmm. and I'm very popular at the synagogue, and so I was the featured speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, that was great. We get churches from across the community, but maybe it's funny, maybe it's class, I don't know what it is, but the Episcopal Church and the uh, synagogue, we're closer to each other than we are to uh, most of the other churches in the, in the community. Uh, put my daughter, uh, I didn't put her on the plane, but she got on the plane in San Francisco and is headed to Bombay or Mumbai. She'll be there for two, three months and visiting school friends, backpacking across the country, even going to the Andaman Islands, which oh, wow. <clears throat> the entire time I am basically ready to have heart <laughs> failure because this is my baby going around India. So, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, but, uh. So we'll, geez, well, it's wonderful to be young and to be able to mm -hmm. do these sorts of things and just have a wonderful time. She keeps going to visit for friends' weddings. And uh, an Indian wedding uh, is a multi-day thing. And in fact, last wedding she went to in uh, Madras, or, or Chennai as it's called, the, uh, the bride's family, she's a friend of the girl, Brought, bought her a whole series of wardrobes and outfits for each of the different days, these Indian dresses and saris and whatnot. So, <laughs> no, I mean, it's exciting uh, to be young. Weddings are, are done differently over there. You remember uh, the crazy rich Asian movie uh, uh, mm -hmm. showed, you know, just the extent to which uh, a wonderful wedding can happen over uh, seas there. Uh, you saw the episode I did with Calvin, Calvin, Kelvin Robinson uh, last week. That went really well. Uh, but I got a, a couple comments. Would Calvin consider becoming a regular? Enjoy this very much. Is George okay? Now, we, you know, George is okay. We're, you're just busy. You have a, an amazing church that's uh, keeping you busy. And we're going through our, our the things that we do when we're 50-ish in doctor's appointments. And I do have to say to one commenter, I have as much hair as Calvin Robinson. It's yes, just right. cut much shorter. Shorter. <laughs> oh, it was a great interview. He's a lot the of number fun. of follicles <laughs> is, is <Yeah>. unchanged. <laughs> I have good head of hair. No, it, one of the few however, genetic things I can boast of. <laughs> yeah. No, but yeah, George is fine. He's a busy guy, and every once in a while, he says, "You know, church comes first. And I say, "Yes, absolutely." You know, our health, our family, and our church come first. And sometimes I've scrambled to get somebody else on. Uh, Calvin was wonderful to say yes. Uh, we're not looking for a future replacement to Gavin yet, but we shall see what happens down the road. Let's see here. Oh, I woke up. It was 50 degrees here in Florida, which for me, that's still short sleeve 
uh, shorts, flip flop weather. George, what are you wearing? I'm wearing a wool blue blazer, wool uh, gray slacks, uh, thick woolly socks, and I have the heat on in my office. And it's only <laughs> in the low 60s outside right now. Uh, let's move on to the news. Brazil has elected their first women archbishop. Uh, now, we should let people know Brazil uh, is already a very liberal province. Uh, they already have same-sex blessings. Uh so this should not be a surprise, George. Yeah, it, there are two Anglican provinces in Brazil. There is the Anglican Episcopal Church of Brazil, which goes by the initials IEAB, yeah. and the Anglican Church of Brazil. The IEAB uh, is a hundred plus year old plant of the Episcopal Church, and it has followed the trajectory of the Episcopal Church. In 2018, uh, the first woman bishop was elected, Marino Santos Basoto. She's Bishop of Amazonia, which is the Amazon region. And at that same synod uh, in 2018, in June of that year, they authorized same-sex blessings, same-sex marriage. Uh, the other Anglican church is the uh, led by a Miguel Uchoa, which is uh, not a plant of the... Uh, uh, ACNA, but comes out of the Diocese of Recife of the IEAB, Bishop Robinson Cavalcante. That was a conservative diocese and a liberal see. And the history was that Brazil's a huge country, and the Northeast, the Recife Diocese, was evangelized by British missionaries, while the South, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and the southern states, uh, Porto Alegre, were evangelized by American missionaries. And when the church was put together, you had the evangelical British in the North influence and the American liberal influence in the South. One church came together, and after about 70 years, it split apart with the uh, uh, conservative North forming the Anglican Church of Brazil. Now, uh, Brazilian, Brazil just went through a national election, and the former president, Lula, who... Uh, is a left-winger, socialist, uh, uh, defeated Jair Bolsonaro. And there are, there's a repeat of what happened in the United States in 2020. Uh, Bolsonaro won basically everywhere but the Northeast. The Northeast, politically, is Brazil, Chicago. Uh, it's corrupt, it's and the courts are political in Brazil. The army is political in Brazil. We don't have uh, what we like to think the United States are of a squeaky clean court system and a squeaky clean military. And there's plenty of indices of fraud. And the army may step in to uh, overturn the elections. The Supreme Court is trying to uh, turn the elections to uh, uh, Lula. And the IEAB is doing what the Episcopal Church would do in this situation. It is talking politics nonstop seven days a week. It's Lula, 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 God's anointed Lula. Um, now, the Anglican Church under Bishop Uchoa does not, is not the mirror where they're just talking Bolsonaro day and night, day and night. But you will find uh, sort of just in the United States that the Episcopal Church leadership is more... Uh, Biden, while the ACNA is more Trump, not universally, you'll see that in Brazil as well. Um, well, yeah, I mean, Brazil, uh, certainly not third world, uh, is a uh, a nation that has been growing uh, much in like 60, 70 years. And it's not surprising that they have uh, left and right wing politics like we do here in America. Uh, but they have more of a, a set in corruption that we thought we had festered out over time and we'll have to see what happens down there uh it's you know it's interesting to watch the southern cone and watch uh churches like miguel Ochoa's have great success down there and continue to grow and we'll have to see what the episcopal church does in brazil george it, it one of the sad things or funny things if you will is that a lot of the actors at dominion software uh that we heard about in the 2020 elections are in the 2022 elections in Brazil. Okay. And we'll just see how this plays out. But the thing we need to remember is 
the Brazilian courts are not like the American courts, where in the American courts they place great stress on being apolitical. In the last few years, we hear about Trump judges and Obama judges and Biden judges, and we're seeing judges who are overtly political, like the new Supreme Court Justice, uh, Bishop uh, Jackson, um, where the ends, the law is a means to a political end. Uh, the other thing is in Brazil, the army does not have a tradition of being apolitical. Now, General Miley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is uh, roundly disliked because he's a political general. Uh, he plays politics and leaks to the New York Times all the time and this and that and tries to influence policies. The tradition of the U.S. military has always been that is no, no, no. The tradition of the Brazilian military is when the government screws up, we step in, clean up, and then step back and allow them to start over again. We may see that happen in this case. Who knows? Well, I remember back in the days of uh, General Schwarzkopf. Uh, you know, they tried to make him political after he had this great vi victory, uh, defeating uh, Saddam Hussein in Kuwait, and he came back as an, a, a war hero. And he, you know, I had nothing to do with politics. I'm going to go and uh, go out of my boat, and I'm going to trout fish the rest of my life. And, you know, people, oh, no, you can be president. He says, no, the army has no uh, desire, no need, and no future in politics. And there was that mm -hmm. divide he set forth uh, that you don't find so much nowadays. Because I remember many of the uh, chiefs and uh, army people who served under the Trump administration were vocal uh, complaining about him or uh, supporting him. Is much different. And it's even written into the Code of Military Justice that you do not talk about politics. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have like former four star army generals, uh, former CIA directors, all these people just weighing in on the television, just saying things that a generation ago would have them called before Congress and say, Okay, if you, you have a choice, you can talk politics or get your pension as a four-star general. You can't do both. That's right. And, of course, those rules are no longer enforced. Now, I don't know if there's ever a time. I mean, it, this is probably me being uh, no vice or clueless, but the FBI and the CIA, I thought, were also supposed to be uh, unpolitical. But I think we're finding both are very political, at least in the last 20 years. Well, the bad old days, the good old days of J. Edgar Hoover were also the yes. bad old days. Yeah, where J. Edgar yeah. Hoover was political, but he was political in the FBI's interests. Uh, the recent uh, last 10, 15 years or so, starting in uh, with the Obama administration, where overtly political partisans were, play, were put in positions of authority in the FBI. The CIA has always played politics because that's what they do, but they're supposed to do it overseas. That's right. But now, but now they have been caught a number of times doing it in the United States. Um, the latest little thing was the, you know, with the Trump-Russia collusion. Mm -hmm. The CIA was uh, spinning that story, colluding with the Australian intelligence agencies and MI5 to push a false narrative. And instead of actually finding out the facts, uh, providing information to the opponents of those who were their opponents. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. All right, let's move on to some further news stories. Um, we have, sadly, miscalled the end of COVID three or four times. I've given the all clear when I got my shot. I said, okay, I got my shot. I got the vaccine, uh, all clear, uh, COVID is over. Not so, apparently. Uh, I got my booster shot, I said, all right, all is clear, go back to work, life can return, we can go shopping, we can go to the amusement parks, and hopefully one day they'll stop making us wear masks in federal government buildings and in doctor's offices. Even that was not true. We had to wear masks, continued. COVID was still out there. It was different varieties, Delta, this, that, this, that. 
I think we can finally, George, at this point, call COVID over. It, I think it, it, it I know not. Okay, Kevin is calling COVID over. All done. Banished. Well, the Bishop of Toronto put out a letter earlier this week saying he recommends that you continue to wear masks in church because of COVID plus the flu, plus another uh, thing that's going around. It's a tri-pandemic or whatever he says. Mm. But, uh, well, that's Canada. Um, that's Canada. <laughs> yeah, we have a Canadian story coming up in a, in a minute or two. But for all intents and purposes, I've been watching the church world return to normal. Uh, I was at the new Wineskins Conference uh, uh, this summer, fall, down in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Everybody gathered, very few people uh, wore a mask. Uh, yes, COVID was present there, but nobody died. Uh, Your wife so, caught COVID. <laughs> my wife caught COVID there. And so, you know, I, I'm reading more and more, uh, not just uh, Anglican services, but uh, church meetings are happening and regathering around the world. And that fear of gathering together is lost. We're now gathering together. We're encouraging each other. We're taking up the work of the church again. And, you know, I think that's something that is evidence that we're post COVID. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've been getting press releases and requests to advertise conferences. New Wine, mm -hmm. the British uh, group, is meeting again after a hiatus for COVID and other reasons at the end of July, beginning of August. Uh, but they're going to be in a new, new venue. They're going to be in Maidstone in Kent. They're not going to be in Peterborough, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, the mere Anglicanism is re starting in Charleston. Um, we've put up something about that on Anglican Inc. Uh, mm -hmm. Trinity Seminary, I think it's got its January term all uh, ready to go and conferences and things like that. So we are seeing a return to normality uh, in some respects. And I think why this is important is that more happens of a uh, political nature at a new wineskins conference than and it ever happens oh, yes. at an Anglican ACNA assembly or council or at a general convention or things like that. These events where people from disparate uh, parts of the church, parts of the world, really do sort of set the agenda for the future. And it's the political meetings that sort of put into effect what has basically been decided uh, at these unofficial gatherings of the Anglican world. Yeah, I've met more missionaries who've gone to new wineskins conference here in America who said, you know, that was the spark for my ministry. I, I didn't think I'd ever be a missionary until I attended a new wineskins conference. And that's where the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and three weeks later, I'm, you know, at, at this location in the middle of nowhere in a, with a language I don't speak, and I loved it. <laughs> it's like, what? You know, and you're right. It, more happens there at, at these new wineskins conference that happens at the General Assemblies or the uh, diocese meetings. It, it's where the church really uh, it sparks and the Holy Spirit turns uh, a, a willowing idea onto fire, George. So it's good to see uh more news we still don't see any of the church of england conservative bishops responding to bishop croft's letter on the llf george none yeah with and that is surprising uh, we went through a little round of uh, five liberal bishops uh, uh, actually two diocesans and their suffragans uh I, Croft and Bishop Inge of uh, Worcester, and then their suffragans, uh, put out the statement, put out affirming noises, said this is what they want to do. And then we had conservative organizations respond. But, and then there was this little flap on Twitter where Bishop Inge said he was told to lay, it off, lay off it by the LLF staff because we don't want to prejudice things. And then he backtracked, said, oh, no, I'm told we can say whatever we want. And we've not had a conservative bishop come out swinging mm -hmm. since the all clear that you're allowed to talk about this was made. Now, what is that telling us? Uh, what I'm taking away from that is that there's a weakness in the conservative Episcopal leadership in Britain, in England. Why do I say a weakness? 
because they put more stress in fealty to Justin Welby and the party line of unity, 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 than the truths of the gospel. Now, Michael Nazarelli, uh, when he was an Anglican bishop, uh, would speak out. Uh, he had been retired for a while, but he would speak out. There are no Nazarellis. There are no uh, uh, Bishop Hines, uh, pe people who will basically break with collegiality when it is a matter of faith and gospel. That is not a sign of strength. It's a sign of weakness because it's putting the collective as the defensive barrier to hold things together rather than allowing the individual to speak truth to power. Um, I know I'm using can't phrases there, <laughs> you too much power and whatnot. But it, it, but it is true. When you have this silence, when it's left to a diocesan evangelical group, when it's left to the Church of England Evangelical Council, when it's left to individual clergy um, to act and to speak and to form organizations with no Episcopal leadership, you're basically saying that um, these are bishops in name only. There was an auditorial in the English Churchman raising this point. That Bishop Croft is basically preaching the gospel that uh, when the Bible, we, we base our truths on the Bible, but when the Bible's inconvenient, we drop them. Uh, and the oaths and the, the, the job of a bishop is not what it once was. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the things we look for our bishops to do is to defend the faith. To be defenders mm -hmm. of the faith, and then to be defenders of Christians when they the, when they see stories that they come across, when they see situations where a Christian needs to be defended in public, I would expect a bishop to do it, and we're not mm -hmm. seeing this at all now. Are the conservative bishops of the Church of England just tired? You know, it's been such a long jury road, and we can see, uh, you know, five years down the road, we've lost. Are, are they predicting the future and said, I don't want to fight it because we've already lost? And hopefully I can still be a pensioner when this is over. You know, I, I, I don't understand where we've lost that desire to do the one role a bishop should do. Don't know. Well, we're adopting the worst aspects of Catholic bishops. In other words, the Vatican's will make titular bishops, bishops of sees that uh, are a name only and uh, were overrun by the Muslims in the seventh century. Um, that's just part of their tradition, where the bishop is a super Christian. It's a super office. They're a, a, a higher person on the pecking order underneath the Pope. Now, we're having these titular bishops appear in the Church of England, uh, Joe Bailey Wells, the bishop to the bishops. In other words, what, what is this person, how is this person actually a bishop? Uh, she's not, she exercises no Episcopal authority, but she gets to parade around with this job. We saw this for years with the Anglican Consultative Council. Uh, Josiah Daiwa Ferron was called Archbishop. Well, that was a, a post that he was removed from. He was demoted. And after his demotion, he was just a regular old bishop because the Church of Nigeria, his peers, voted him out of office. And But once he retired, he got the Archbishop title back from the Archbishop of Canterbury. And what we're seeing here is a papal system of bishops in the Church of England, in the Episcopal Church, really, being super Christians. In other words, I'm better, I'm more important than you because I have this title, but not exercising the office of bishop. They exercise, the, they take the prerogatives, the perks of the office, per perquisites, but they do not respond with the responsibilities and job of a bishop, of being faithful stewards of the faith handed to the apostles. Well, and we're seeing yeah. rank and file clergy in England, in the United States, taking true Episcopal roles uh, and not, not those who get to dress up in purple. Well, and I agree. And especially you see Trinity Wall Street and you see the Archbishop of Canterbury try to identify and pick winners, not based on mm -hmm. church, not based on the gospel, but based on holding together this unity 
holding together this uh, liberal tract of the church. And um, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to watch because through money and through uh, their office, they have that ability to pick winners and losers. And uh, who they I, ignore. Who I forget which ignore, church father. Yeah. I forget which church father it was who said the road to hell is paved with the skulls of bishops. It's, but the longer I'm in this life, the more I, I see that to be true. Uh, but hey, I, I am what I am. And I come from the that school within the Episcopal Church that bishops are a necessary evil, not the uh, bene esse of the church. But uh, <laughs> there you go. I've revealed my colors. All right, we're going to go back in time. Uh, 2006 was the year. Uh, I was running a blog called the Connecticut Six, which turned into Anglican TV, and you know the history. No doubt. You've been watching us for a long time. We appreciate that. At the same time, back in 2006, another blog started called Archbishop Cramner out of the UK, and it's one I've been following, and I'm sure George has as well. We learned yesterday he's decided to hang it up. He's done blogging. Don't know if he got the job or whatever, but... Uh, Kudos for sticking with it for 16 and a half years. That's a long time to watch just this short history of the church and to kind of watch the slow destruction of the Church of England. Hard to watch, I know. But George, you certainly follow him? Yes, I've been a long time reader. It's one of the ones I subscribe to, mm -hmm. the blogs. And uh, he's on the center right in the British political and religious spectrum. Uh, he does both secular politics and British and church politics. Uh, he's not like Ian Paul is another well-known conservative blogger, but Ian Paul sticks to religion mm -hmm. in the Church of England. Cramner uh, is great; did has done a great job, and I don't know why he's stepping away. Um, he maybe just wants to get out of the game at the very top. Uh, maybe, as you say, he's gotten a new job. Sure. Uh, they, won't give him the freedom because, you know, running a blog like that thousands of comments uh, over the over over time and really good, well-written, thoughtful stories, that takes a lot of effort. And so I will miss him. And uh, uh, if you want to uh, store your stories <laughs> with Kevin uh, as an archive or let me sure. post them on Anglican Inc., I'd be happy to do so. And yeah, he's got some great writers, people guessed. Great, great, right? Like Martin Davy, for once, the theologian, and Martin Sewell, uh, who's a member of General Synod. Um, really good writers, and I just hope they find a new outfit, hint, hint, outlet, like Anglican Inc., hint, Anglican hint, Inc. that will publish them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they but, could you know, respond we're to the, the, the email right here. There's your, here's George's email address, and uh, sign up to be an Anglican.inc uh, commenter. Absolutely. Now, one of the things I liked about Archbishop Cramner is he had so many commenters for his articles. Uh, he would post a, an article uh, once or twice a week or uh, uh, maybe three or four times a month sometimes, and people were very uh, energetic about commenting on it. And we never had that many commenters, George. Well, Cramner was a British phenomena, mm -hmm. and that uh, is a, I will call it, a, British nationalist. He saw things from worldview. Uh, he was very proud of being English. He was very proud of his church, of his country, as we are of our church and our country. Well, maybe our country. Uh, <laughs> uh, and in Britain, they seem to be more, uh, they're freer in their written comments than they are in their spoken comments. While in the United States, we're fear, freer with our words but rather than our writing. Yeah. Uh, so maybe partially cultural, but it really was a great place to read uh, back and forth because you'd get liberals and conservatives commenting on the same issue. Yeah. Um, I, the only thing I would ever fault him for is that he held on to an esteem for Justin Welby way past the point that I lost it. Um, but no, I think I don't know. No, no, there, there, there's truth to that because, um, and it, probably his church nationalism and his, his, you know, his British nationalism, he certainly uh, was a denier of the track that the, the Church of England was taking. 
uh, from my reading of his comments. Uh, he was kind of a denier that Brexit was going to happen. And Brexit happened, and you got to read about it, uh, certainly on his blog. And I think he came around. I think he sees that Justin Welby uh, is not good for the Church of England. I think he sees that uh, Brexit is the way forward and for uh, Britain to have its uh, inter independence. So uh, if you do want to store your blog somewhere, uh, I'll store it for you on the uh, servers here at Anglican TV. Uh, if the writers and commenters of uh, Archbishop Cranner's blog are looking for a place to go, we will gladly have you uh, sign up at anglican.tv. The one thing I wonder, and again, I have no first-hand knowledge of this. I'll need to ask Gavin Ashenden to help me understand. He's had he's led the the web led the way on revealing the abuse crisis within the Church of England. Mm -hmm. And twenty odd fifteen years ago, the abuse crisis in the Catholic Church caused people who were very active in writing about the Catholic world, some of them like Rod Dreher, to leave. They were very, pro I mean, they were Roman Catholic, they were very proud of it, they pushed that, and then one day they became Orthodox, uh, because they couldn't live with what they knew about the Catholic Church. I'm not saying that he knows something that we don't know about the schools and this and that, but he has done yeoman's work in publicizing and giving space to those who have highlighted the abuse scandal mm -hmm. and the bullying scandals within the Church of England. And I know that it's so destructive for uh, uh, a supporter to see something that is so important to them be shown to be flawed. Absolutely. I don't know. It's hard. It really is. Uh, let's move on. Good ACNA news. Uh, Bishop Jones and uh, Archbishop Foley helped rescue an Iranian priest who was going to be deported back to Iran by Turkey. And this Iranian priest and his family are now safely in America because of the hard work of some uh, bishops here, George. Nice to see. Two stories here. One is praise and honor and blessing to Derek Jones and Foley Beach. Mm -hmm. Hekmat Salimi is an Anglican priest with, uh, who was in Isfahan in Persia, Iran. He had to leave the country basically because he was eventually going to be killed. Mm -hmm. um, the church in Iran, Anglican church in Iran, has basically been decapitated by the, the mullahs who have uh, killed or expelled the clergy. And he and his family made their way to Turkey. Well, Turkey under Erdogan has not been very welcoming to Christians, especially Christian refugees from Iran. And he was going to be sent back to Iran, which was essentially a death sentence. Well, Bishop Jones of the uh, Armed Forces Jurisdiction of the ACNA uh, helped bring him to the United States, he and his family. And he was met by, Salimi was met by Archbishop Jones, uh, Archbishop Beach and Bishop Jones at the airport uh, upon their arrival in the United States. And they're going to be helped to be settled in the United States. There are Iranian expat communities in the United States, uh, Long Island, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, Orlando. Uh, Orlando's a nice one uh, for weather if you want uh, nice weather. But perhaps uh, he can be helped to start uh, Iranian Anglican congregations for the communities in the United States of Anglican expatriates, or he just may be ready to retire. I don't know what his ministry plans are. That's the first half. The second half is why is Derek Jones doing the job of the Anglican Consultative Council Secretary General? This is the job for the Archbishop of Canterbury and uh, the ACC, rescuing persecuted clergy from hostile countries. Why is Bishop Jones the one who has to do this? Now, I'm glad Bishop Jones did it. They don't even have a ball. They're, I don't know what they think they're up to. But this was a job uh, for the, that the ACC is created for. And where are their fingerprints on this? Nowhere to be seen other than a thank you for your letter in due course we'll write back but oh i'm sorry we can't do anything business so what you know what do these people think they're doing in london oh i know what they're doing they're sending delegates to climate change conferences and celebrating 
you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury has put out a lovely letter thanking Hindus for the Diwali uh, festival. Um, yeah, that's nice. But what is the real job? If he aspires to any sort of influence outside of uh, the Diocese of Canterbury, he's not doing his work. He's no. not doing his job. His job is to be a defender of the faith and defend the defenders of the faith. And he mm -hmm. wasn't doing that. Away without leave, they call it, in the military. That's what the Archbishop Absent, Canterbury. absent, absent without absent. leave. Yep, no question about it. All right, let's move on here to going down my list here. Uh, Mozambique bishop wants a promotion. Well, if you're a bishop and you want a promotion, that means you want to be an Archbishop, George. Uh, a sad story. Uh, brand new province, Angola, Mozambique. And it could go one of two ways. It could go the South Africa way. It could go the Tanzania way of uh, liberalism externally, corruption internally. Or it could go the Gafcon way, the Uganda way, the Rwanda way of being squeaky clean and faithful to the gospel. What's the problem? Well, the Mozambique church and the Angolan church have been split off from South Africa. They're forming their own Portuguese-speaking province. And they've now got seven, I think, 11 total dioceses. It's really rapidly growing church. The Bishop of Labombo, Carlos Metzina, is 68 years old. And he has been buddy buddies with Tabo Makoba, the Archbishop of South Cape Town, South Africa, and Justin Welby. Welby is scheduled to go down this month to the uh, installation of the new primate. Well, here's the problem. The, Ang the Mozambique press has got a hold of the fact that if Metzina, who is 68, is elected primate, it will violate the brand new canons and constitution of this church because you must retire when you're 70 and you can't run for office if you cannot fill a complete term. But that's sort of being winked at because by the South Africans and Lambeth Palace, Maybe they haven't read the Constitution. Maybe they're just taking it on the say-so of uh, Carlos Metzina. That, oh, yes, I have, I'm have. i perfectly able to serve. But the Angolan press, uh, the Mozambique press, is writing articles saying, look, this is a bad way to start. The first thing out of the box is for a church to violate its own rules to allow the big man to stay in power. This is what they did in China, allow Chairman Xi, you know, only allowed two terms. Chairman Xi, oh, I'm going to run for a third term. This is a, you know, this, this. Well, I think if you the, go most, down, the most famous church for violating canons is the Episcopal Church, who has a canons you should not sue. Uh, <laughs> yes. Kevin, that's a whole new <laughs> series of, uh, but, but, the, the, but here, and it's not George who's saying this. This mm -hmm. is the secular press in Mozambique saying, we finally arrived. We're finally able to do this. Why are we starting off in this bad way? Yeah. Why are we emulating Zimbabwe with Robert Mugabe, uh, the boss forever, instead of a church as laid out by the canons and rules? Well, jobs for the boys. That's what we call it here. And so, all right, let's talk here. Oh, Canadian story. Love those Canadian stories. Archbishop Nichols of the Anglican Church of Canada says in an article she wrote, if you don't attend or didn't attend the last Lambeth, you are not an Anglican. Surprise. I'm surprised. That story so surprises me, George. Uh, bully in the sandbox. Oh, Linda Nichols is being silly. She's saying that because Nigeria, Rwanda, and Uganda have boycotted the last two Lambeth conferences, they're no longer Anglican. Mm -hmm. Because being Anglican means showing up and sitting at for a week's worth of lectures and tea parties in, in crappy dormitories built in the 60s in England. Uh, it, it's, it's so presumptuous and so bumptious of Linda Nichols to begin to define Anglicanism when she has basically forced her way into the tent of the Anglican world, spouting non-Christian doctrines on marriage, on human anthropology, on basically the Anglican formularies in scripture. She demands acceptance for her point of view, demands entrance into the club, 
demands these things, who demands to be treated equally, and when people who hold fast to the unchanging teaching of the church object, those who object, because they have left the room, are now outside the tent. Um, it's just the way uh, liberals seem to work, of forcing themselves in, and then uh, once they're in, seizing power and excluding those who do not share their beliefs. Yeah, they it's um, a schoolyard bully. It's somebody who comes in, says, we're going to play this game my way. If you don't like the way we play the game, uh, too bad for you. You're not, you're not part of the schoolyard anymore. It's a shame because, you know, if, Anglican, if the future of Anglicanism is the Anglican Church of Canada, we're all in trouble because that church is just collapsing faster than... Uh, Oh, the souffle I made last Sunday night. <laughs> <That's gonna laughs> straight say, down. Straight down. Well, we don't know how fast it's collapsing because they refuse to publish their numbers. It's mm -hmm. a church in a free fall, just living off its savings because nobody attends the church, the, the Anglican Church of Canada anymore. And we know that because they refuse to publish their numbers. Uh, you, you know. Well, you what know. are you going to do? What are you going to do? Uh, we love, no, we don't love to. We are required to, as journalists, uh, frequently report on the corruption in India. Uh, we do that not every episode. We could do it every episode, but we don't. We're not going to talk about it this episode, George. We're not going to talk about Anglican corruption in India. We're going to talk about Lutheran corruption in India, George. Oh, my. Oh, Bishop Surendra Kumar Sukha, who is the bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Madhya Pradesh, which is central India, has been arrested by the feds, the federal um, economic offenses wing of the, of the federal treasury department for fraud and money laundering. He is accused of, of stealing 50 million rupees, which is about 600,000 US dollars from the Lutheran Church's pension fund. So we've been reporting about the primate of North India, who's currently in jail, has mm -hmm. been refused bail for theft and fraud, and the primate of South India, who's uh, under active criminal investigation for money laundering and fraud and theft. But I just want you to know that it's not just us. A Lutheran bishop's been arrested, and there have been uh, arrests, uh, interrogations of Catholic bishops and Orthodox bishops on charges ranging from rape to money laundering to selling state church properties. Um, questions that Indian Christians have asked me is, why all of a sudden has the gov state federal government, after basically being hands off on church corruption for a generation, decided to start going after these crooks? Now, it's not because they're making up this stuff. These guys are crooks, and yeah. Indian corruption is an ongoing issue. But could it be that the Hindu nationalists in power think that there's no downside for them to start uh, arresting crooks because it doesn't affect their constituency the way it would if the Congress party was in power? So It does make the Hindus look on? good. You know, the Hindus look like they're trying to take care of corruption, even though within the uh, Hindu political... Uh, corporation in India, much corruption exists, but uh, Christians should not find themselves in the position where they have to defend their corruption, George. Well, yeah, I th Kevin, you're absolutely right. It's, you know, you shouldn't have a culture where being a bishop is a job that you pay for so that you can steal to recoup, recoup your investment and make money for yourself and your buddies and family. That's become the practice in the Church of South India, Church of North India. Um, not every bishop is, but at one time, the majority of bishops in South India were under active criminal investigation for fraud, had complaints lodged against them. The lay people, the power of the laity is limited in India, and those lay people who are in power are corrupted by being part of the swindle. Remember the tsunami that struck uh, Indonesia and Thailand and met over to South India? Oh, I think it was at the very beginning when we started Anglican Unscripted. Well, the uh, 
secretary, the lay person in charge of the Church of South India, absconded with millions of dollars of relief funds and is still missing. Uh, well, they know where she is. She lives in a villa in uh, the Gulf states with her money carefully uh, set aside and living a very nice life on stolen church funds. Um, it Maybe it will take somebody like the Hindu nationalists to clean the Christian houses of their culture of corruption and impunity. I think that's the thing that rankles me more is the impunity that there is no, uh, there's no hiding this crookedness. There really isn't. Now, not all Christians, far from it. Many faithful, many, many faithful pastors, a number of faithful bishops, but the culture in which they're operating is difficult, uh, to say the least. And we find that not just in India. I don't want to pick on India. We find that uh, worldwide, even here in America, we have built-in corruption. Uh, China is famous for its built-in corruption. Uh, Zimbabwe is famous for its built-in corruption. And we need to be able to raise up the leaders who have said no to the corruption and are teaching the true gospel. We need to pray for them and find them and raise them up, George. Yeah, uh, this links to another little item I mentioned to Kevin, but remember we reported on Bright Malasa, the bishop of Apishire in Malawi. Yeah. He's the guy who wanted a million dollars to go away. He was 46, 47 years old, and he basically is a crook, and they found the records of it, but they didn't want to bring him to trial. And he said, fine, if, you, if I retire early, I need to be paid until I'm 65, or I'll take a lump sum of a million bucks. And the, the diocese in the province don't have a million dollars, but they were able to get him on a technicality because he snubbed the archbishop for a number of meetings and therefore was deposed for heresy. Uh, he was excommunicated, excuse yeah, me. Yeah. Well, Bishop Bright Malasa uh, has, is un undergoing eviction from the diocesan office and the church-owned house he lives in. And he's fighting that. And it's in the papers in Malawi saying, I'll leave once I get my million bucks, but otherwise I'm going to take this through the courts all the way to the Supreme Court of Malawi. So what, four, five, six years until they can get him out of, uh, out of the, out of office? So the bishop that I call the million dollar bishop is now the squatter bishop. Yeah. But, you know, again, he's saying, I'll go if you give me the money. Mm hmm. Now, right. how is this bishop in any way, any way, caring for the charisms of episcopacy? Is this a father in God? This is a godfather <laughs> <laughs> in the mafia sense, but yeah. it's not a father in God. He's not uh, holding fast to the faith once uh, given. He's not living a life that is exemplary to other Christians. Uh, he's a bishop in name only, just like... Uh, the bishops in the Church of England, just like many of the bishops in the Episcopal Church. He's, uh, not, defending, he's not defending the faith, he's embarrassing the faith. Yeah. So we've got a lot of equal opportunity <laughs> offenders here, Indians, Africans, Europeans, Americans, South Americans. We've got it all covered. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this generation um, in our next and last story. Uh, a lot has happened, uh, certainly in the last 10, 20 years. If you watch anything in local politics, you've, you, you, if you've listened to the show at all, we talk about this generation has been raised by the universities and by the schools to be very liberal, uh, to hate their country, to hate the church, to hate each other, to be the new racist. Uh, everything is about skin color. And one of the things that George and I kind of talked about in the pre-show was this new cult that's forming, the, the climate cult, where these kids over, certainly in Europe, are running into museums with cans of paint or ink or whatever, mashed potatoes are one, it was one of them, and tossing them onto great works of art or, or gluing themselves to uh, statues. Uh, there's a, a great um, video online, and I'll link to it, where they were uh, blocking traffic in Italy and the police were protecting them, but the, the 
drivers in Italy said no. They went and they just tore them out of the uh, the street and drove on by. We're not Italians are kind of cool that way. We're not taking no crap from some uh, climate terrorist. And this is a new cult, George. The the cult to to save Mother Earth. The cult to uh, save uh, equality. The the cult to save um, uh, some false racism. And it it's hard to watch. Because there's also a transgender cult, this, this Joseph Mengele cult that's going on here, uh, certainly in Europe, in the West. And I think we, we need to talk about it because we're going to be addressing this a lot in the next uh, year or two on Unscripted. Yeah, there's so much, Kevin. Uh, most recently, a Gustav Klimt portrait was doused with uh, ink and uh, vermeer. Uh, some kids, uh, I say kids, people in their 20s, accompanied by some old fart clergy of the Church of England, blocked the ring road around London. And there were stories about this one fellow who was on his way to his father's funeral and had to sit in traffic for hours, missed his father's funeral, because the British police weren't willing to basically physically remove these kids squatting on a highway. Um, they did an interview with some, and the thing is, these are all middle class, upper middle class kids and vicars. This is a war against the working classes, the working people, by the privileged. And listening to these children, and they are children, even though they're in their 20s, they have this apocalyptic worldview that they've got a year or two left before utter devastation occurs. Now, what's happening here is this. I think we talked about this 10, 15 years ago, about the new religion of environmentalism. Mm -hmm. And Al Gore was one of our favorite characters. And the most popular Anglican Inc. story of all times was the one that was linked to the Drudge Report, where it brought down your server, Kevin, <laughs> uh, where Al Gore opened, uh, Al Gore hired the Church of England as a client for his environmentally friendly uh, investment fund. Well, Listening to these young people, they're crying, their utter belief that the world's end is nigh. And these clergy who have lost their faith in Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, and have adopted uh, the mindless sentiments of environmental activism, they're the new pagan. They're pagans. They do not worship Jesus Christ. They worship the earth and Mother Earth and the earth goddess. And if this helped along by the go along, get along clergy leaders of the Church of England and the Episcopal Church, of uh, Justin Welby joining the COP27 worldview that unless we take this action, the world will end. Well, the, sci the true science, not the political science, the true science has doesn't say says that's not true. And I don't want to get into that because I'm not a scientist, but I can marshal my resources against anybody who says otherwise. Well, but yeah, the but it's yeah. just a new belief system. It's it not is. Christianity. Yeah. Well, it, it's a belief system that clearly doesn't have anything to stand on because it denies your ability to question it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Th this new belief system denies the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. denies that that we should have discussions about it this science is in stone proven science and you can't discuss it anymore even though when i went to uh my little high school science classes with mr marx he says the only science is science that can be proven by science and science is there to build up science and you know it has to be tested by science and continually tested and that's why science changes so much, George. Well, we have a completely this, different idea of what we live in and understand as science than we did 20 years ago. Well, this generation is studying a different Mr. Marx as their science teacher. It's mm -hmm. Karl Marx. And oh, yes, it is. The, the Frankfurt School mm -hmm. of, uh, of postmodernism, uh, neo-Marxism. And this is infecting the churches. Uh, now, hear me right. I am not saying that there is no evidence for man-made climate change. If you deforest a region, if you do this and that, yes, there will be things that happen. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about an apocalyptic worldview that the Earth has a life of its own and that we are 
to appease the earth and to worship the earth. This is what drove last year we reported about a Church of England vicar who stood on the steps of the News Corp building in London and sewed his lips shut because of in protest to Fox, uh, the News Corp not speaking about climate change. This is driving female vicars in their 70s to climb atop commuter trains and London stations to disrupt traffic because they firmly believe the end is nigh. This is the stuff we saw in the Middle Ages with these millenarian apocalyptic groups that, you know, we need to act now because the end times are coming. Uh, this is what drove Jim Jones to commit suicide in the jungles of Guyana. Well, he didn't commit and suicide. He killed his followers and then committed suicide. That's true. He killed yeah. himself, but he killed everybody <laughs> else. else. Yeah. And yeah. Here, here's the thing. Uh, Jordan Peterson speaks most eloquently about this, is that the new elites, the the 26-year-old uh, kids who, tr who push this green agenda and are willing for the developing world to remain in poverty, to have shorter lives, to have no opportunity, so long as they can have their privileged lifestyles in the West and have pretend energy, have pretend economies, have pretend things, whereas the capitalist revolution has done more to lift people out of poverty than anything in human history. And now this generation, now that they have achieved uh, the ability at the age of 26 to not need a job so that they can be professional protesters and then destroy, they're willing to destroy the opportunities and chances of people in the developing world, the own poor in their communities, the people who need to go to work, who live paycheck to paycheck. They're willing to destroy that so long as their angst and anxiety is fulfilled by these pointless and rather stupid acts. Well, we say pointless and stupid. They were raised to be virtue signalers. Mm. Okay, they weren't raised to be great readers. They weren't raised to be great mathematicians. They weren't raised to understand uh, all the, the, uh, the, the science and STEM in our, in our world. They were raised to have a political opinion and to march forth with that opinion and to be virtual signers along, along the whole way. Uh, Twitter had a whole class of employees who really didn't do anything. They post their videos uh, a day in the life of a Twitter employee. I, I watched one yesterday and this lady got up and she showed up to work at 10, uh, logged into her computer. She would go to the lunch cafeteria, have free food from noon to 1.30 or 2. Her boyfriend from the uh, tech company across the street would stop by. She would talk to him for two and a half hours. And then finally, about five o'clock, she would sign off and go home. And there are, you know, sadly, this new generation doesn't work like our generation used to work, George. Mm -hmm. um, I know people who uh, got jobs in the 80s, work their tail off, work their old, um, their overtime and uh, experience the work life differently than this new generation. This new mm -hmm. generation feels a little bit more entitled to the jobs. Uh, this job that I have, I'm entitled to, and I can make demands of my employees, uh, my employer, more than uh, my generation could. My generation, we're happy to have our 401ks, we're happy to have our overtime, we're happy to have some of the benefits. We're Generation Z is out there demanding it. You know, they didn't work for it, but they, they won't work without it. Well, it was timely that in the lectionary, we had Paul's uh, 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 statement that uh, last Sunday, that if you don't work, you don't eat. Uh, you must provide for yourself. You must work. You must be a contributing member of society. But what we are, where we are right now is a number of people in the church, in the world, believing this new cult, this new religion, this new faith that excludes uh, Jesus Christ, that does not see the world in the way Genesis is written. It rather um, uh, sees things in the semi-Hindu worldview and semi-Buddhism of, of cosmology and creation. The new paganism is the strongest religious faith on many of these college campuses. Mm -hmm. It's not the faith of Jesus Christ.
you know, as I talked to with uh, Calvin Robinson, we have a generation that won't reason, that won't sit down and talk, uh, that when you do have a discussion, they mock you uh, for, for, well, you're just a boomer. Uh, okay, yes, I am. <laughs> George is too. But, uh, you know, we have opinions, and up until this generation, we were always told to look to the older generation as the wise generation as people we could learn from and the schools and universities have have cut off children from the the uh, older generation don't trust any remember don't trust anybody over 35 george uh from 1972 it's it's yeah. back it's back well it's not universal it's far from universal but those people are given a disproportionately loud place in yeah. the culture of ideas, culture of the world. Mm -hmm. And we are uh, kowtowing to these ludicrous beliefs. We had the President of the United States bring a, uh, a, a man who thinks he's a woman into the White House to talk about women's issues. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Russia, Vladimir Putin is threatening, threatening to use nuclear weapons against the Ukraine and, the, and NATO. Well, what's the President supposed to do that day? give two and a half hours to a transgender activist who to talk about women's issues. Mm -hmm. We're in a really strange world. How much does President Biden hate women to pretend a man can be a woman? You know, that's, it's beyond parody. It's where we live right now. But these are issues we'll be discussing more and more on Anchor and Scripted. We've reached the end of our time. Probably went six minutes over, George. We'll have to see. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 772 of Anglican Unscripted.